what is happening in Isaiah. So it's, it's a little hard because we're a couple hundred years different between what we are on Sundays, which is Daniel, and that's a couple hundred years later. They're already in Babylon. So what's happening now is in Isaiah, Isaiah is a prophet to the southern kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom of Israel has been being wiped out and taken over by the Assyrian uh, army. And the Assyrian army is charging hard at um, Jerusalem, right? A lot, again, a lot of the outlying cities had already been attacked by the Assyrian Empire. Uh, but their temptation has been to make alliances with people that God doesn't want them to make alliances with. And God always tells the, the Israelites, you'll never lose a, a battle if you just trust in me. And what do they do? They don't trust in him again and again and again and again. And so what's happening is um, the nation of Judah is facing uh, this ruthless army run by a guy named uh, Sennacherib, and they are coming to encamp around Jerusalem when King Hezekiah is in power. So Isaiah chapter 31, verse 1 reads, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses, who trust in chariots because they are many, and in horsemen because they are very strong, but who do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord. And so the Assyrians through their art and their depiction of themselves through archaeology, we know that the Assyrians had chariots that were pulled by multiple horses, not just one, like oftentimes you'll see in, in ancient movies or art or whatever. And uh, many times they'd have up to three people, one driving and, and two people shooting arrows or throwing stuff, whatever they're doing as, as their weaponry, slinging swords or whatever. And so these were kind of like the tanks of the day. And so uh, the Jews, you know, they, they fought with small, small swords. They're, they're hand-to-hand -hand combat, close combat type people. And this is a force. It's like a blitzkrieg coming upon them. And they're fearful, right? So what are they going to do? Are they going to trust God against chariots? <laughs> And so they're, they're kind of freaking out. Now, it's not always wrong to seek human help, right? Uh, God doesn't want us just to sit back, and uh, he, he wants us to do the things that he wants us to do. But he doesn't want us to do the things that he doesn't want us to do. And so he did not want them doing certain things, going down to Egypt. Um, because there were times when the Lord said, get up and fight. Get up and march. Get up and do this. And so they would do that. The problem is they are not doing what God wants them to do. And therefore, they're not trusting in God's plan or God's ways. Okay? So human help isn't always wrong. But the point is God wants you first to go to him and get instruction. You know, when we, we pray for people, for their help. You know, we pray for supernatural healing. But we also pray for wisdom. And that healing can be through a doctor. That's fine. But you want to go to the Lord first with your healing, right? He, he, wants, he wants to guide you. But please do not trust in ungodly means to attain your goals. You know, God wants me to give to the mission field, and therefore I'm going to start selling pot or whatever. You know, <laughs> or, uh, People come up with some harebrained ideas over the years. You know, uh, when I first uh, went full-time into ministry, I was on staff, and within that first month, um, it's like they were picking on the new guy. And so they put me in charge of the walk-in counseling. And so if someone came in with a problem off the streets or just wanted to drive to a church to get counsel, I was on for that particular day. I think it was for a week, actually. But the first person that walked in was this woman who told me that she sold drugs on the side, and it really helped. She was living with her husband, but she was actually an ethical drug dealer and a really good Christian. <laughs> you know? So it was funny. So I, I, I go, eh, no, you're, you're not even living in the gray area. You're, you're living in sin, and you're claiming something that you're not. You may be saved, but I, don't, I wouldn't call yourself a strong, ethical Christian. You know? uh, and the neat thing is she got her life totally together. And before we moved out here, uh, um, I got to dedicate her children. She actually came to me as a youth pastor and said, please dedicate my children unto the Lord. So it was really sweet and neat what the Lord had done in those years. And she started serving at the church and everything. But I'm an ethical drug dealer. You know, I know when to cut people off. 
<laughs> after you get them addicted, right? So anyways, but we have all these compromises in our life, and, and we can justify almost anything, right? We can justify so many things. And so the Lord tells them to not uh, go back to Egypt. Egypt was, was a symbol of the flesh in Scripture. And we, we have a couple pictures of this. Remember when Lot's wife was leaving Sodom, and he said, don't look back. And it wasn't really, you know, personally, I don't believe it was a physical act of like, okay, are people following us or what's going on here? It was looking back longingly and desiring to be back there, right? Now, remember with me, when the Israelites were leaving Egypt, they left because Egypt had become a horribly bad place for them. The first couple hundred years they were there, it was fine, but God had blessed them so much, the Egyptians were fearful of them, and so they, they enslaved them, and God kept on blessing them, and so they kept on trying to oppress them, and the more they oppressed them, the more the Jews multiplied, right? And uh, so they made it so hard on them, and then just a few weeks out, they start going, Oh, but back in Egypt, we had enough food to eat, you know, and they romanticized their slavery. Oh, when, when Christians get together and they start talking about the old days, don't, don't get stuck in that trap, you know, because you can romanticize about how fun it was in college, you know, and, and you know, the parties and everything, and, you know, and, and I always remind myself, yeah, a lot of the times those parties ended up with my head in the toilet, you know, feeling horrible the next day. Um, you know, just the messed up things, the loneliness, the frustration, the angst, the stupidity, you know, and then, uh, okay, 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 I'm not going to romanticize that. But so often we can look back and go, oh, the days, you know, get over it. Don't look back to Egypt, right? And so he had made a specific a command for the kings that they were not to cause the people to return to Egypt. Deuteronomy, which is a summary of the law before they went into the land from Moses, he said, he shall not multiply horses for himself, speaking of kings, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. Don't go back there. Don't go back to the flesh. Don't, don't go back longingly to this place. Don't turn that way again. And that's just such a good admonition for us as Christians. And especially if you're a younger Christian, those things, those memories are fresh in your in your brain and those habits are ingrained in your brain and your brain hasn't retrained itself to not go that way uh, you've got to protect yourself from going going back and so they're not supposed to go to egypt and this is what isaiah is strongly warning them against now for us we can go to so many different things when we're hurting right and uh, when we're threatened when we're scared but we want to do it god's way we want to do it God's way. How does God want you to deal with things like anxiety? Does he want you to go to drugs? Does he want you to go to, you know, I don't know. There's all kinds of things you can do. Some of them are bad. Drugs and alcohol, wrong, right? Um, pornography, wrong. Uh, but what about surfing, for example? That was on the top of my head for some reason. But there's nothing wrong with surfing unless I put it in front or of greater importance than the peace of God, right? So, so here's what I say. I go to God and I pray about my anxiety. Then he tells me to go surfing. Then it's okay. <laughs> but this is true, right? Because we know that, you know, exercise or taking a walk or various things, the Lord can lead you into certain things that are good as long as they are not the thing that you put before God, right? God gives us ways. God gives us wisdom. Sometimes he just wants you to wait and sit with him. Sometimes he might want you to pray and fast, right? But um, the, the, the best way is the first way, which is coming to God, right? Because it says, and we know this verse well, it says in Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, She'll guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And I love the fact that God can give us a peace beyond our comprehension. Why? Because we're not that smart. If we had to figure out what that peace was like in order to get it, we probably wouldn't get it as much, right? You don't always have to understand. I got a call or someone contacted me somewhere in the country. Someone had heard that we had had a stillborn baby. And tomorrow afternoon, I'm going to have 
um, a time with a couple that had just lost a ha- had a stillborn child, you know, late late term stillborn baby, and um, and I'm going to tell them I'll, I'll give them all kinds of things, but I'm going to tell them ultimately you got to pray for this peace because you're going to try to figure it out, and it, it's the reasoning is going to be beyond you. And so it has to be beyond under your understanding. And what a blessing that Lord, the Lord can give us a peace without us figuring it out. But we want to go to him. It says by everything, not some things, not most things, not the things that you, know, you don't have handled. Go to, go to him then when you're at the, at the end of your rope. You know, and people say, well, finally I, pray, I prayed. And so I prayed after trying everything else. Let it be that you pray first, right? And so Paul tells us to deal with anxiety by going to the Lord first. You know, Warren Worsby says of the history of the Jews, think of the money the nation of Judah would have saved and the distress they would have avoided had they only rested in their God and obeyed his will. All their political negotiations were futile and their treaties worthless. They could trust the uh, words of the Egyptians but not the word of God. This was their problem, right? They wanted to trust in other things. They built idols. They tried to trust in idols rather than God. How different. Now, God was going to bring forth a message and a Messiah through the people of Israel, one way or another, through their obedience or their disobedience. And it wasn't complete disobedience, but it certainly wasn't complete obedience either. It was mostly disobedience and some obedience for for the Israelites to bring forth the message and the Messiah, right? That's what God chose them for. God was going to bring it forth. But how different would the Bible have been written and how different would the stories be and how much more glorious they would have been had the Jews obeyed God the first time and not went into idols? How different would the scriptures look had they obeyed God? So, hallelujah. (laughs) So, At the same time, you know, God sometimes does, you know, act first and and rescue them in their mess as they're crying out, you know. And God does all the work. Sometimes he sends them into warfare, right? There's, There's different ways that God works. When they got rescued from the Egyptians, who did most of the work? God, right? All those plagues? The, the, the Red Sea opening, the fire by night, the cloud during the day, the water in the desert, all that was God. They didn't have to work to get it. Now, when the nation of Judah, and this is a story I refer to a fair amount, when the nation of Judah was being attacked by the Ammonites and the Moabites, it looked hopeless. King Jehoshaphat, yeah, it's a funny name, jumping Jehoshaphat, But he was a good king. He was a little naive, but he was a good king. He gathered the people together, and he did the right thing because he prayed. His story is found in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 12. Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. What an awesome, pure prayer. But what a radically humble prayer, because this is the king of a nation. Could you imagine a president coming out today and just going, we have no idea how to respond. But you know what? Let's pray. Now, we'd all respect that president way more (laughs) than any president living during our time, you know. But this is what he did. And this is the type of humble prayer the Lord wants to hear. I don't know what's going on. I remember um, early on in, in the church, I had an assistant, and he would come to me, and he'd ask me a question. i go, I don't know. He's like, you're the pastor. You have to know. I go, really? Like, I don't? And he'd, like, try to force me to know, and I'd look up like, I really don't know. I could make something up if that makes you feel better, but it doesn't mean it's the right answer. We just need to pray. We really have no idea. 
what to do. And I can't tell you how many times that happened, especially when we were building the building and different things were going on, different trials were happening in the life of the church, you know. And I would just like, I don't know. We just got to pray. And that's the right answer. You know, it's scary when you have money in the bank because then you start thinking, oh, this is what we do, and then you forget to pray, right? So here's Jehoshaphat. He's, he's humbling himself, and he says, now all Judah, with their little ones, <laughs> they included everybody, their wives, their children, stood before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of uh, Zachar, Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mathaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. And he said, listen, all, of, or all you of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours. The Lord's just saying, okay, get out of the way and watch. Tomorrow, go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jerel, and you will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear nor be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them, for the Lord is with you. So what are you going to do at this point? Just go out. And at this point, he's not saying, oh, bring your swords or anything. He's just saying, show up. Take your families. Just, really? Yeah. And the Lord is going to deliver them. So sometimes the Lord says, I got this, stand back. Sometimes he says, this is what you're going to do. Right? And this is what you do. So it's different. There's a couple of situations where David comes to the Lord, and it seems almost identical to the previous situation. And the Lord tells him two radically different approaches to take to the very same situation. And that's what we need to do. And why does God do it that way? Why doesn't he give you a, a formula for everything? Well, the formula is pray and obey. That's the formula. But his answer to your prayer can be radically different. Why does he do that? Because if, if, if it was just a formula, we just attach a formula to everything and we'd never pray. We'd never depend upon him or we'd never wait upon him. We'd never come back to him. He wants us to be dependent upon him. Why? Because he loves to hang out with us, right? He wants us to come again and again to him, right? So this is what's happening. And then it goes on, verse 18. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord again. You see a president get out from behind his podium with the seal on it, lay down on his face, and just start crying out to the Lord. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Korathites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And, and as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. There's a verse in Peter that talks about that. It was a verse that helped Noreen and I not run back to California when we were first planning the church and facing trials. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now when they began to sing and praise, the Lord sent ambushes against the people of Ammon, Ammon Moab, and Mount Seir who had come against Judah and they were defeated. Send the worship team out in front of the battle. Can you imagine the Marines? Get that brass band out here. Set them out front. <laughs> you know? But they're praising the Lord. And the Lord brought defeat. Fight the battle my way, and you will have 
my power and my results in your hand. Fight the battle my way. Express trust in the Lord by praising him. What does the enemy not want you to do? Pray. Praise God. Whatever it might be. You might, you might need to uh, change the atmosphere in your workspace. You might need to change the atmosphere of your marriage or your, your home or your relationship with your children. But praise the Lord. The enemy hates that. But praise the Lord. He wants, uh, the enemy wants you to quit. But God is faithful and actively involved. And I found out, for me, you may not tell that I'm radically stressed, but I'm fairly paralyzed. I don't get a whole lot done. My, my, my countenance may be fine, but in my heart I'm, just, I'm getting nothing done because I am just paralyzed when, I've, when I have anxiety. But it's, it's neat because over the years I realized God is still working. It doesn't all depend upon me. And he knows I'm paralyzed. He knows my weaknesses. And he's still working behind the scenes. And I've just got to fight through and trust the Lord and take that next step. Some people say, what if I don't know what to do? Listen, there's always something to do. And that something that you can do in any situation is pray and praise. You can always start there. And so he's looking at them, and through Isaiah, previously he had said, you trust in horsemen, in verse 1, because they're very strong, but you do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord. What is your problem? You respect them greatly. What am I, chopped liver? I'm the God who has delivered you historically in so many situations. Verse 2 goes on and says, Yet he also is wise and will bring disaster and not call back his words, but will arise against the house of evildoers and against the help of those who work iniquity. The Egyptians aren't the answer. God is also wise, and he doesn't take back his words. What he says goes. He is faithful with his words, and what he promises is done. He keeps his word. Verse 3, now the Egyptians are men and not God. Duh. And their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, both he who helps will fall, and he who is helped will fall down. So the Egyptians and the Israelites will fall down if they do it this way. They all will perish together. For thus says the Lord, he has spoken to me as a lion roars and a young lion over his prey. When a multitude of shepherds is summoned against him, will, he will not be afraid of their voice nor disturbed by their noise. So the Lord of hosts will come down to fight for Mount Zion and for its hill. And so the Egyptians are going to fall. It's nothing for the Lord to wipe out the Egyptians. Now, if you're united with the Egyptians, you're going to fall too. So don't unite with the Egyptians, basically, is what he's saying. And he gives them an illustration. There's this huge lion, and there's a few wimpy shepherds. Here comes this lion. The lion wants, ha, ha, has an objective, and he's not worried about these wimpy shepherds. The Lord represents himself as this powerful lion in the story. And uh, he's just going to ignore the, the, the whimperings of, of the strength of the Egyptians, or the, the whimperings of the Egyptians who think they're strong. And here's what we always got to remember. We can be terrified by our enemies, but God is never afraid of your enemy. God is never afraid of your enemy. For me, I, I don't like to be intimidated by people because I like to be able to walk up to people and just talk straight up, right? So early on in my, my life, you know, I'd, I'd met a few famous people, but then when I went on the surfing, surfing tour, uh, all of these people that I used to have as, as my sports idols, as it were, um, I met, I got to know, I actually became their judge, uh, literally, right? So it was interesting. So I, I, I kind of got over the fame thing. And then, um, then I found out that I get really nervous around pastors that I respect. 
Yeah, because they're right in my realm, right? You know? And then after time, then I start to become more of a mentor to other pastors. And it's just funny how you, like everything starts to change. And then you see, you know, I still have mentors, but I can talk to them straight up. I don't get as nervous around them anymore, right? And it's just maturity. You grow up, you know. Um, and as someone that, that goes to college and, and likes to learn and take classes and stuff like that, I would be very intimidated at times on, uh, on college campuses. And I, I no longer am. You know, and, and it's just it's just maturity. It's just it's just um, it's just time. And uh, at the same time, there, you know, every so often I get I get nervous around people, and I don't know what they're thinking about me. And uh, I met this you know real famous lawyer in the Christian realm, and he he runs the uh, Americans Defending Freedom organization and started the Homeschool Legal Association and stuff like that. And I was talking to him, and I was like tongue tied, and I stumbled over my words and I was all goofy and everything <laughs> and I'm just like what in the world you know and then I, I just pull back and I go it's just a man it's just a man like me you know and uh, but whatever the situation I don't know what makes you nervous or who, who can put a little bit of anxiety into you nobody is smarter than God no one is stronger than God no one is wiser than God. No one has the ability to maneuver all of history like God. It doesn't matter who they are, the President of the United States or whatever. The Lord told, Jesus told the disciples, when you're brought before councils, you're brought before the magistrates, don't worry. Be happy. No, he said, don't, don't worry. The words that you're, that, that you're going to try to figure out, just open your mouth. He's, he's not saying... Don't be prepared. Don't be ready. What he's saying is, don't worry, because I'm going to be there with you. When you're fighting my battle, I'm your power, right? When you're doing things my way, I'm your power. And so God isn't impressed with their posturing. They're, they are mere humans, Egypt. Later on, Babylon, Assyria is nothing to him. Psalm 37, verse 8, it says, cease from anger. And forsake wrath, do not fret, it only causes harm. But those who wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and delight themselves in the abundance of peace. You know, God loves you intimately, and he knows you, and he's on your side. And so when you come up against something that seems like it can overwhelm you or eat you up, just know this, the meek shall inherit the earth. Those that are just relaxed in God. Meekness is power under control. I got a big brother. He's got a lot of power. And he's, and he's watching out for, for his little brother, Right? The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth, and the Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. I love that. The Lord laughs. <laughs> you know, I don't know how he laughs, but. For he sees his day is coming, and the wicked have drawn the sword, and they bent their bow, and they cast down the poor and needy to slay those who are of upright conduct. Their, their sword shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. You know, it's funny because you hear about these people that are just trying to accumulate billions. They have hundreds of millions of dollars, and they still want more, and they're still making deals. How much is enough? And here's the thing. If you look at satisfaction levels, I'm richer than most billionaires. And if you have godliness and contentment, you are richer than most billionaires. But what do we do when we get around a, a millionaire or billionaire? <laughs> They're chasing after something that they can't keep. And it does them no good at the point of their death. 
right? But man, they think it makes them all that. The Lord knows the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. Verse 20 says, but the wicked shall perish and the enemies of the Lord like the splendor of the meadows. They shall vanish into smoke. They shall vanish away. So he's, he's not fearful of the Egyptians. Verse 5, like birds flying about. So the Lord of hosts will defend Jerusalem. Defending it, he will deliver it. Passing over, he will preserve it. It's ironic because God had delivered Israel with a Passover, right? And he's saying, I'm going to pass over it again, and I'm going to deliver you again. Be inside my protection. Be inside the walls, and you're going to be fine. If you're outside the walls, you're not going to be so fine. Now, it's interesting because when he passed over that first time, before this time that he passes over them, where were they? Egypt. Ironic, isn't it? They want to go back where? To Egypt. Verse 6. Return to him against whom the children of Israel have deeply revolted. For in that day every man shall throw away his idols and, and of silver and his idols of gold. Then which your own hands have made for yourselves. Return to him whom you rebelled against. And someday it's going to happen and you're going to burn your idols. Idols are such an interesting thing because we always see idols as these little trinkets or statues, but idols can take so many forms. I don't know if you guys have heard this term, uh, solo gamani or like matrimony, sala gamoni. You're marrying yourself. It's a real thing and it's happening across our country. Why? Because people have made themselves their own idols. They have love affairs with themselves and they want to marry themselves. Here's an article. It says, uh, sologamy or self-marriage is, is a symbolic ceremony where you commit to maintaining a meaningful, deep, and loving relationship with yourself. Hmm. The idea is to hold your own heart and to care for it as much as you would someone else's. A lifelong commitment to loving yourself fully. Some paint solo weddings with a self-indulgent brush and view them as, as being critical of traditional two-person marriages. But they are inherently not egocentric or approval-seeking because self-care is not selfish. <laughs> self-marriage is not about eschewing outside love. Rather, it is about accepting our light and dark sides and prioritizing self-care prioritizing self in order to have better relationships moving forward with ourselves and with others. Hmm. What a useless waste of time. But what a what an object of self idolatry or what of idolatry. You know, by nature God created us to care for ourselves, and by some definition that is love. You care for yourself. And there's a point where you do need to care for yourself because God gave you this incredible body. And you're supposed to take care of it, right? And, and use it for his glory. It's one of those tools that you do all things as unto the Lord, including taking care of your body. And so, you know, to the man, he makes it very simple in Ephesians chapter 5. He tells the man, take care of your wife like you take care of your own body, right? And that's what he's saying. You, you already love yourself in a very practical way. We don't need a ceremony to love ourselves more, you know. We do take care of ourselves, you know. But what a lie it is. Because we, not only do we normally create idols that, that we, we can control, and many times are in our own image, if it's a statue, we, we give them characteristics that we want out of them, and we're forming our own gods. You know, we, we, we can do this, but to make yourself an idol, it really brings you nothing. It brings you nothing. What brings you everything is for you to know that God loves you, and God proved his love for you 2,000 years ago on a cross. He showed it by dying for your sins. I mean... Marrying yourself is just ridiculous. Idolatry is ridiculous. It's, it's just putting something in front of God, right? But Isaiah here foretells a time when Israel will eventually get rid, rid of their idols and they will worship the true and living God. Verse 8, 
Then Assyria shall fall by the sword, not of man. A sword, not of mankind, shall devour him. But he shall flee from the sword, and his young men shall become forced labor. So the Assyrians are going to fall from a sword, but not belonging to a human being. Psalm 34, 7, comforting psalm. It says, the angel of the Lord encamps around all those who fear him and delivers them. He's watching what's happening to you. Nothing can happen to you um, without him knowing it's going to happen. Yeah, we live in a sinful world, and he's still going to use all things for good, and we could still suffer here, but ultimately, we're going to be in heaven. But he knows what's going on intimately in your life. So when it says they're going to die or fall by a sword, not of man, this is what actually happened. Isaiah 37, or, yeah, 37, 33. Thus, therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city. What a comfort that would have been to Hezekiah, right? He's not going to come in. This is Isaiah, a tested prophet. Nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor build a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same he shall return, and he shall not come into the city, says the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Then the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, there were corpses all dead. So Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, departed and went away and returned home and remained at Nineveh, tail between his legs. So all the support crew, all the, all the fighting soldiers are dead. And Sennacherib has nothing other to do than to go back to Nineveh with his tail between his legs. Later on, he's, he's murdered um, by his own people. So one angel on Passover, the angel of death, came over Egypt, came over Israel this time, and took care of him. And he rescued them again through a Passover. Verse 9 goes on, and it says, He shall cross over to his stronghold for fear, and his princes shall be afraid of the banner, says the Lord, whose fire is in Zion and whose furnace is in Jerusalem. His princes shall be afraid of the banner. This is an interesting phrase. So those that were not killed by the angel and those that would return back to Nineveh would be afraid of being around Jerusalem. Why? Well, they're afraid of the banner. A banner. Well, listen, God is the banner. He is the banner. What is a banner? A banner is something that identifies and unifies a particular group of people, a flag, a rallying point over the people. And so when God proved himself in front of Sennacherib and he lost his whole army in one night, they became afraid of the sign of God's protection over the people. And God is our banner. Isaiah eleven nine it says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain." For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that, in that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles will seek him and his resting place shall be glorious. This is interesting because it talks about our banner. Who is our banner? Jesus. Who rallies us together? Jesus. Who, who unites us? Jesus. Who strengthens us? Jesus. Who lets people know our identity? It's Jesus. Right? And there's this worldwide group of people that stand under the banner of love, Jesus. And it's an awesome thing, isn't it? So in, in June, uh, my wife and I are going to be heading to Brazil for about nine days, I think. And we're going to be sending um, a week with a, the Brazilian pastors and, and their leadership from their churches. And, and I'm just so excited to do that. You know why? I love going to these places with people that are like-minded and love the Lord. Because, you know, I've been working on my Portuguese. Uh, Fala Portuguese, mais ou menos. Uh, mais ou menos. <laughs> you know, like, more or less than more. I, I speak Portuguese is what I said. Um, but uh, there's such a banner that hangs over those that truly love the Lord. And it's been everywhere I've been in the world. I've, I've been all over the world. And, and there's this banner. 
you know, we have a group of young people that are in Mexico right now, and they can't talk with the kids, but I tell you what, when they connect with the missionaries and everything, and even with the kids who, who love the Lord or the mamas down there, that, that they're down in Ponte Vida right now, um, there's going to be a unity of fellowship that they're going to experience that you just, it's his banner, it's his rallying cry, it's, his, it's the thing that gathers us, it's Jesus, right? So the banner over them was the sign of God over them, actually. And for us, that banner over us is Jesus. And listen, they feared God. Now, we fear God in respect, but we're not terrified of God, right? And one thing that we need to remember during this time is we're of the Lord, we're not of the demons, You know, it's funny, because what's happening in the Supreme Court right now, which is crazy, because someone leaked some, some early um, indications that Roe v. Wade will be overturned. All that happens when Roe versus Wade is overturned, and it looks like it probably will be, is the federal government admitting that they have no place in abortion. And what happens then is it just goes back to each individual state. That's all it's saying. It's saying it's not in the Constitution at all. Therefore, we have no right to speak about it because it's not a part of our law. And when Roe v. Wade was, was enacted, it became a law, and it shouldn't have been. It just it was it was bad. It was bad a bad choice, right? And you had five Republicans uh, that were on that five supposedly conservatives that were on the Supreme Court at the time, and they did vote with two other two uh, liberals, and they did vote for. For this law that has stood. And that meant the federal government had the power to force states to have abortions in, in, their, in, their, um, in their state. So all they're saying, all, literally all they're saying is, we're removing our opinion, basically. We're not, it, it's not in the Constitution. We have no right to speak about it. That's basically, they're vacating their decision, basically. Which is the right thing to do. So, that being said, you have all these people freaking out and, uh, and getting violent. And when you get violent, aggressively violent, now there can be violence of defense, right? But when you're aggressively violent towards the peaceful, you've lost the argument, right? There's, there's no argument. They're just trying to force by intimidation of you, you know, and and they talk about uh, the rights of all women born. The problem is you use born in that sentence because abortion doesn't allow someone to be born alive, right? And um, it's, just, it's just wild what's happening. And, and we look at these pressures. But for us as Christians, we gotta, as we're facing this world, and I'm going to keep on encouraging you with things like this because we need it today. I do not want you to compromise as believers. You can peacefully and lovingly say no. And people might attack you for it, but, but you need to stay on God's side because eternally, he is the one that holds your life and future in his hands. And, and he is right. And it's not my opinion. People say, well, your opinion. I'm not, not my opinion. I agree with God's opinion for sure, but I didn't come up with this opinion, right? Right? And so just understand that you stand on solid ground when you stand on moral truth, okay? Um, but just remembering this, um, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And that's a simple verse there, but it's so powerful. Just remember when you stand on God's side, you're standing on the right side. I don't really care about the right side of history. Everybody's like, you're on the wrong side of history. So what? When I'm dead, what does that matter? I want to stand on the right side of God. I want to be one that God says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in what I have prepared for you. I want to have the creator of the universe wipe away every tear. I want, I, I want to get my nickname in heaven, the name that I share with God that only he and I know. How cool will that be? I do want to see the streets of gold. I do want to worship before the throne of God. I want to get my assignment in heaven. 
I, 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 I want to talk to Moses. I want to talk to Nebuchadnezzar. I think he's there. We'll see next Sunday. You know, I, I, I want to. I, I'm, I'm so excited for this. And so if someone says, you need to do this or this, I'm just going to say, peacefully and lovingly, he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. You might be able to take my physical soul or my physical life, but you can't take my spiritual eternal life. I got it. You can't take it. You can't steal it from me. He who is in me is greater than he who is in you, right? And so we just we, we need to stand with the strength, not obnoxiously, not sinfully, obediently, and trust in the Lord and let him give us that peace as we walk through these crazy times. And the thing is, people respect your strength. In a group, they won't. Individually, they respect your strength because they don't have it. They are insecure in their position. And that's why they have to lie and cheat and steal and manipulate everything because they aren't secure. But we can be secure and just answer peacefully and lovingly, nope, nope, nope. Rest in him. He is the one that holds your soul. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, we thank you for your word once again. And Lord, as we uh, leave the comfort of what we call the sanctuary, Lord, and we enter into hostile territory, Lord, may it be that we walk in your peace, that we know your peace, Lord, that we don't consult idols, but that we come to you in, in humility and, and trust in you and your ways, Lord. And if we're sick, may we pray before we go to the doctor. If we're anxious, may we pray before anything else, Lord. And may we find ourselves firmly planted on solid ground in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and close with a song.